Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about artists' stories and journeys. I am Katie Brewer and today I am lucky enough to be talking to singer Sonia Jones. Sonia is one of the top backing vocalists and vocal coaches in the music industry. She sang the title track to Monty Python's Life of Brian when she was only 16 years old. She was the lead in the Broadway production Dreamtime and has performed in multiple other musicals, plus the TV show Let's Rock. She has toured with The Who, Spandau Ballet, Mike Oldfield and James Last. She has recorded with The Rolling Stones, Van Morrison, Simple Minds, Peter Gabriel, to name but a few. And she has performed with the likes of Dave Gilmour, Annie Lennox and David Byrne. If that wasn't enough, she became a vocal coach and Rita Ora, Izzy Bazoo, Bombay Bicycle Club, Sodi and Joy Crooks are among her pupils. In addition, she arranges the backing vocals for a band I am in called The Stacks. She has set up her own management company, Dragonfly Artists, and is looking after a new band, Bagawire. Sonia, I am so excited to be talking to you today. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us on Bandwidth Conversations. Hi, Katie. Lovely for me to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, with all that you've achieved, I kind of feel you either need to have a sort of a Harry Potter time turner or you are, must be hundreds of years old to have managed it all. But let's go right back to the start. You grew up in Wales and tell me a bit about your upbringing. It was a really family orientated upbringing in a small village called Davin. And I loved singing. My whole family used to come around. My father had seven brothers and three sisters. My mother was an only child, but they all used to like singing. So any birthday or Christmas, everybody would come around and sing harmonies. And I guess I learned harmonies when I was about three or four years old because everybody else was singing harmony, so it became very easy for me. And I loved singing. And from about nine or ten, I joined a choir called the Howell Girls Choir and did a thing in Wales called Eisteddwoods, and I did Pinillion with the harp. I did my first tour when I was about nine. I went to Prague and Czechoslovakia and performed in Pinillion, which is Welsh, and it's all about singing harmonies to the harp, so it's great for year training. And... I knew I wanted to be a singer. I knew 100%. And did your parents, what did your family think about wanting you to be a singer? Obviously, they were singing as well because you were doing that as a family. Were they encouraging of that? Not really. They thought it was a great fun thing to do, but they wanted me to do well in my exams and be a clerk or be a school teacher or work for the council, an accountant, like my two brothers have done very well, and they're businessmen. But I had no interest whatsoever. None. And did they listen to you? Well, they didn't. And they're the loveliest, lovely, loveliest parents. So much love. So I decided I was going to hitchhike to London and with my guitar on my back and started busking in Hammersmith Tube Station. And they came and found me, thank God, and (laughs) took me home. And then they realized that they came back to London with me and set it flat up for me. We didn't have much money, but I got a job in the Hammersmith Palais uh, six nights a week and supported myself. And that was the start of my singing. When you did your hitchhiking to London, oh God. how old were you then? About 15, 16, very underage. And where did you where did you sleep? There was some older people I knew from my village and they were staying with an auntie somewhere in Dulwich. So I told them I was coming, so I went and stayed there. <laughs> my poor parents, honestly, I've never... Girls, boys, don't ever put your parents through that. I've <laughs> never. But then you came, and did you have this job at the Hammersmith Palais before you then established yourself? No, no, the- what happened, there was a music paper called The Melody Maker, and any singing jobs, it just come out every week on a Saturday, and all the singing jobs were advertised. So I applied for it and there were queues all down Shepherd's Bush Road for one position with this band. And I walked in and I sang a couple of songs and they said, can you start on Monday? Do you live in London? I went, yes, which I didn't. Which you didn't. <laughs> and I didn't really tell them the truth about my age. And I went and got time out and found a flat in Ealing. And it was a girl from Ireland Records and 
And she said, well, you're the first I've, I've seen. So, you know, I want to see some more. No, I said, you must take me. I'm in the music business. And she said, okay, then. So I got a flat and a job in, in, <laughs> in one, one day. day. <laughs> and then your parents just said, okay, that's... Then I went home, told my parents, and they they brought me up with my clothes. And my father was so worried. London was the wicked, you know, the big city. But, you know, they phoned me every day and they helped me out. But I was earning my own wage, which, which was pretty good money. And so was the Hammersmith Palais, that was your very first job then because I remember you saying that you were doing jazz standards in the afternoons there and then you were you the the, sort of the house band it was the resident band so in the evenings we'd be singing everything from the charts and then some afternoons this is where Strictly started they used to have all the ballroom dancing so I had to learn all the standards you know, Moon River and, you know, sort of the waltzes, the quick steps and, you know, what a difference a day makes. All So it was great training because I had to sing everything and in any key. <laughs> hard work. Very it was hard very work. hard work, but I loved it. I loved it. And in your band, I think you mentioned before, Trevor Horn was a band member, wasn't he? Trevor Horn was in the Tony Evans band and he was the bass player. And he went on from there to produce. I remember doing a session for him with Lee, Lee John from Imagination. We did a duet called Cuddle Up and Hold Me Tight. God knows what that, what that was like. <laughs> but then I did a few sessions for Trevor. And then, of course, he became Buggles and Yes, and now one of the biggest producers in the world. So not long after that, because you were 16 years old when you sang the title track, The Brian Song, which is kind of extraordinary because I have heard that song over the years and I've always thought Shirley Bassey was singing it. So there, and it was Sonia Jones, age 16, with that powerful voice, which is quite extraordinary. But how did that happen? When I was in the Hammersmith Palais, two producers were there one evening, Andre Jackman and Dave Howman, and they were Monty Python's producers. And they had a small record company with EMI called Rebel Records, and they signed me up. And Gavin Dare. Just there and then? Is that how it happens? They no, they, they, they approached or... me and they said, could I go in for a meeting? And they said they'd like to sign me up. And I thought, this is fantastic. So I had my first deal, record deal. And Andre's studios was in, in Covent Garden in Neil's Yard. And above his studios which was Terry Gilliams, where he did all his animation. And he came down and Andre said, this is Sonia Jones. Terry and he said oh you're Welsh and I said yes you know and I was very very Welsh because I just got off the bus you know <laughs> and he said can you sing like Shirley Bassey and I said no because it was, I sounded nothing like her my my stuff was totally the opposite <laughs> and um he said oh please could you try this song for us so I, I went in and I went over the top and I went Brian the bay but they called Brian and it was a demo I don't even know if I got paid for it but the next thing, they rang me up and they said, we love it so much, we're going to use it for the title music. <laughs> and they invited me to the premiere and I was sitting next to John Cleese and he said, are you an impersonator? I said, no. And then my voice came on and it was so big, I tried to crawl under the seat <laughs> in front of me. I was so embarrassed. But that was how Life of Brian stuff came about. Brilliant. And more recently, you went on tour with them, didn't you? Yes. With well, crew. what happened after that, they wheeled me in to do The Meaning of Life. So I married Terry Jones in The Meaning of Life and I was a nun. <laughs> they got me up to do extraordinary things. And then a few years ago, we did get a BAFTA in New York. So they invited me for that in the, oh God, Springfield, something theatre. So they couldn't get together to do the BAFTA in London because Terry was so busy doing his films with Johnny Depp and, you right. know, everybody's all over the place. So, yeah, we went to the Zigville Theatre and we had the BAFTA things there and they decided to recreate some of their best sketches in the O2. And I think we booked it for a week and it was so successful, we did it for a month every night. It was great. It was packed. And was there one particular Monty Python that you particularly struck a chord with? Was there anyone that you would say, obviously they're all your favourites. Oh, but just they're, they're all lovely. Well, Michael Palin is the most gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous man. He is, as you see him on TV, is what you get. Then Terry Jones, bless him because he passed, is always, hello, Sonia, and big cuddle, you know, <laughs> really lovely Welshman. And of course, Terry is great, you know, Canadian and 
You know, you go, oh, come here and have a cuddle. And last time I saw him, he said, I'm so worn out from all this traveling for these bloody <laughs> films. <laughs> That's brilliant. After that, when you were 17, you became a boppet in the television series Let's Rock, and that carried on for two years. What did that involve? I got a call from a producer, and he said, We're doing, it was like the old boy, Jack Good, who was a huge producer for rock in LA. And he wanted to do a series for ITC, American company. So it was Lulu, Shaken Stevens. Alvin Stardust, I yes. think he was in it. Then I was one of the singers with Carol Kenyon and Sylvia Mason. And it's the three girls, like the Ike and Tina Turner, the Ikeettes. So we were the Ikeettes and we were called the Bopettes. And we had to learn dancing, act, everything. So we rehearse every week in London, then get a bus to ATV Studios in Birmingham and just have a ball. And the series went, we did about six series. It was huge in America. I think they showed one series over here. Again, it was great training, great fun. I managed to find. Oh, you found a clip. I know, I I did. (laughs) I found an episode and I saw you and it looked like you were pretty much doing a different musical a week because all the choreography and so much dancing, so so much to learn, (laughs) songs, new songs. And there were sort of 20 of you on stage at, at any one point, all doing things in a coordinated way. So it was, oh, it it was been- so much work. Lucky, lucky I was young because I could never do that now. Never. <laughs> and when you sort of looked at sort of Shaking Stevens and Lulu, was there some sort of magic quality about them at that time? Did they stand out in a certain way? Shaking Stevens, we all had a crush on. It was before he was really famous, but he was very mysterious. His manager, Freya, used to walk him out. He wasn't allowed to talk to anyone and she kept him very much the star. So he'd come on and do his moody Elvis thing and then be taken away. We all had a crush on him. Um, Lou was great. She was the just the friendliest, like she is, you know, she was great fun and we all just hung out together. Party after the, after the work, we party hard. Well, I remember she sang with us in the stacks and she was just this sort of tornado of well, energy. She always um, has been. And when she left, we all had to sort of sit down and have a cup of tea or, you know, even though she's older, she just had this extraordinary energy. And and I didn't know whether there was something about that that just made, whether it gives you more drive, more, I don't know. I think she's got an incredible voice. And as a young girl, her first record, I believe, was Shout. And she had that... Scottish, you know, that guttural tone and made her stand out. And yeah, she was a worker. She is a worker. She works very, very hard. When I was working with her later on, just for some backing vocals, we had to go to a house. She lived in Hampstead at the time, a house she used to have with Robin Gibb, I believe. I think it was Ozzy Morris, can't remember which. And then she was with John Frieda. And we used to go to her house with a choreographer and work every day on just for backing vocals, getting all the moves and She's such a perfectionist. You could see that even now. So you're juggling all these different jobs. Is anybody advising you or helping you decide what to do? How does it work? It's word of mouth. It was word of mouth. It's changed a lot because people realised, agents realised how much money was to be made in this. But most of my, my phone would go and I never knew who's going to be on the end of the phone. And I said yes to everything. Now, around about that time, you were also one of the final six artists in the running to represent the UK in the Eurovision Song Contest. It was no? Tony Colton and Jean Roussel song called Here Will Stay. It was a big ballad that I was signed at that time to Magnet Records and recording a song called The Wind Song, beautiful song. George Benson did a guitar solo bit. And, and anyway, they called the record company up and said they wanted... He Will Stay, and I sang it. So I wasn't sure about doing the Eurovision, but the Eurovision then was a big thing. But it was very commercial, and my song was definitely cool. It was a big ballad, and it wasn't really Eurovision, but it was great experience. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And I managed to find that as well. Yeah, and, and yes, it's oh, really cool. So afterwards, because it didn't win the six, I think it was somebody like Buck Spears or one of those bands did. But after that, Frida from ABBA recorded it as her first solo record so I thought so, okay <laughs> so meanwhile you have toured with Spandau Ballet The Who James Last Mike Oldfield you performed live with Annie Lennox David Byrne from Talking Heads 
David Gilmour from Pink Floyd. Tell me about Spandau Ballet. They had their first massive hit, true, I'm talking world hit. And my lovely friend, Vicky Brown, who was in Let's Rock, who's married to Joe Brown, because he was one of the artists in Let's Rock, one of the main guys. Their daughter, Sam Brown, who was then 15 or 16, she was definitely the youngest. We started doing session work together. And Spando's manager called Vicky, who was a world-class, you know, she worked with Joe Cocker, with anyone you can think of, Brian Adams, everybody. They called her to do the backing vocals for this American and European tour, which was for about nine months. And she said... No, definitely not, you know, because the the guys were so young. They're all in their early 20s. She said, no, give it to my daughter and her friend. So they said, okay. And Sam and I went to Sinclair Road, the studio's there, and we met them all and we rehearsed. And we all got on like a house on fire. And we went on tour with them. And we used to watch, they were Coronation Street fans. So we had to watch (laughs) all over the world episodes of Coronation Street, but <laughs> but they were sweet. They were so nice because we were the first backing vocals they'd had and taken on tour, so they treated us fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And what was it like going on tour with them? Because I had a crush on all of them, so they were real heartthrobs, and they must have, there must have been loads of female fans oh, God, throwing yes. themselves at throwing. them. And what was that like? For some of the concerts, all you could hear was screaming. The whole place was screaming. <laughs> <laughs> And they all had girlfriends, steady girlfriends. So they were they were really well behaved. They're really well behaved. And, and the girlfriends would come out them. sometimes and have a weekend. In, if we were in a place for three nights, the girls would come out. But most of the night it was like hit and hit and run, which is you do a concert, go to the hotel, leave first thing in the morning. There wasn't time for any visitors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what about, I know it's much later, but what was your experience with The Who? Oh, The Who. That was a wonderful phone call. Billy, one of the singers with The Who, Billy Nickel, he rang me up and he said, um, Tessa Niles has recommended you, and she sings with Eric Clapton, to work with The Who. And could you find some mates, some other singers to do it with you? So they wanted a boy and a girl. And I, I said, yeah, great. It was for the Princess Trust in Hyde Park. And the Who hadn't been together for 20 years. And I remember the first meeting I had with Pete Townsend. We were up in Bray Rehearsal Studios and I had a Labrador. And he came up to me and said, have you got a Labrador? And I said, yes. How do you know? And he said, all your shoes are chewed. <laughs> <laughs> Like so, my Labrador. Oh, absolutely. And then we did the Hyde Park Princess Truss, and Roger got hit in the eye in the rehearsal with a microphone, somebody swinging the microphone around. He had a patch over his eye for the concert, but it was incredible, the buzz. You know, it was wonderful. From that, they invited me to Madison Square Garden. Wow. And we worked there for a week. So we used to call the little Irish bar across the road from the hotel we were staying in, the office. So after the show, we all used to get there and locked in because they don't shut. And we used to party. I mean, really party. And then it was wonderful. In addition to all of this, you're performing on albums for the Rolling Stones, Simple Minds, Van Morrison, Bill Wyman, Peter Gabriel. I mean, there's there's so many. But tell me what happened with the Rolling Stones because I know that was last minute it was very last minute. So Tessa Niles and myself were performing in Wembley for the event, which was Cliff Richard's biggest thing he's ever done, where he had his music from all the different eras. And of course, we were the 80s, you know, the Miss Unites and all, all that era. And we were coming back in a cab and Tessa got a phone call from Chris. Oh, Chris Kimsey. The Stones producer. And he said, I've got Lisa Fisher in the studio and we need additional backing vocals are you free and she said oh we're just on our way back from Wembley so we went straight to the Olympic studios in Barnes which is used to be the studios and um, there was Mick Jagger and Chris and they uh, played the song to us and he wanted a big effect like African effect so he was conducting us so we did quite a few songs and then we all went for a curry (laughs) <laughs> surreal you know sit across the road in a little curry house in Barnes there's Mick Jagger Chris Kimsey oh B gosh. Tessa Lisa yeah so I really he was great everybody was great really nice guy 
Well, let's move on to your musical career, because in 1991, you demoed some songs for Marc Serone, who had created the show Harmony, and it was going to be performed on Tokyo Harbour. Yes. And Tina Turner was going to play the lead. Well, that's what he said, because he was a big Buddha, and she was a Buddha, and they were great friends, and they'd seen the Dalai Lama together, and he was under the impression that, but uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if there was... That was true. Okay, but that's what you thought when you that's went there. That's what I was told. And this was to celebrate the launch of Japan's first high-definition TV satellite, I think. And there was an audience of over 800,000 people. I think it was 900,000. 900,000. So. But there were screens set up in all car park. You know, it was being transmitted to car parks all over Japan. Okay, so you're on the plane over thinking that you're doing a particular yep. job and probably feeling quite relaxed about that. Oh, great. I thought I'm going to have a great time. I've never been to Tokyo. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and then and then what happened? Well, I got off the plane and all of a sudden these women started saying, come and get your hair done. And I thought, oh, okay, great. It's film because they were filming it. I thought, brilliant, you know. Then Bob Mitchell, who's the producer of all the songs and written the songs, he said, Sonia, you've got to sing the songs. I went, you are having a laugh. You must be joking. He said, no, Tina Turner hasn't turned up. Now, that's why she would not do that. But all the clothes from Paris were the ones she, they were bustiers and tiny little skirts with heels so high. And I had to wear all these things. They put a wig on me, but blonde. And I had to learn four songs to perform in front of all these people for the next night and walk down ramps and there were gold bodies all dancing around me and it was a rock show and there, it was a super band behind me. Oh, I was nervous. My legs were shaking. Did you even know the lines though? Well, I demoed the songs, but when you demo a song, Katie, you never sing it again because it's for somebody else to sing, you know, because yeah. you're a session singer. You sing the songs for the artists, the writers to get somebody else famous to sing them to make the money. I remember tunes, but lyrics are my, it's a nightmare for me. So I was just going around Tokyo and they were playing with my hair, putting makeup on my face, dressing me up. And all I was going was, one more night, one more night, one more night, muttering, muttering, muttering. Like, so I didn't, I didn't see Tokyo at all. Well, that's a shame. But you did it because I also saw you did it magnificently. Well, so you, you honestly, I can't believe it. When I look at it, I look so confident in, I was shaking. My knees, I thought everybody can see my knees were like shaking so much, but it doesn't, you can't see it. No, not at all. It no. looks like you've been you know, rehearsing it for, for years. No, and I was walking around the huge stage with all these gold bodies with hearts coming towards me. And, I <laughs> and as a result of that, you were the lead in Dream Time. Dream Time, yeah. And at the Ed Sullivan Theatre in New York and... What did that involve? So that was David Niles, who I think Aerosmith did the first. It was high definition film. He took the rock opera and invited myself and Steve Overland from FM to be the man and the woman in this dream time. So we're in the Ed Sullivan Theatre and we'd fly over every weekend to New York or every other weekend for a few days. And I'd sit in a chair in an empty theatre and I had to look at one chair then turn my head and look at another chair. And it went on for hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, it became dream time. And I thought nothing of it. So then I was invited to New York years later to work with David Byrne in Carnegie Hall to do four or five dates. And a bus passed. And I saw a picture of my face on the bus. And I thought, what the, what is going on? <laughs> so I went to the... Ed Sullivan Theatre, and it had been turned into a play. I went in, and it was really weird. The band had a night off, so we all went together to see what yeah. was going on. And there I was up like a huge hologram, and Steve on the other side, and us interacting in big screens and walking around New York and acting, and all live actors on stage. And then David and I said, oh, Sonia Jones is in the audience, and I had to go up and get flowers. But so in all the brochures in the hotels, there I was, my face, come and see Dreamtime. And you hadn't realised? No, nobody told us. <laughs> Talk about, mm, wow. naughty. That yeah, is quite naughty, but very cool. Very yeah. cool, though. And then you also did Time. Time. Written by Dave Clark. And on the album, it features Stevie Wonder, 
Dionne Warwick and Freddie Mercury. Mercury. Yes. And the first lead was Cliff Richard and the second was David Cassidy. And I think I'm right in saying there was, at some point, there was a rather unusual ice cream seller. Well, one of the nights uh, we closed the theatre for all proceeds to go for AIDS charity. And in the interval, everybody's getting their ice cream from this very cool looking guy with his, uh, you know, with his ice cream outfit on and everything. And half of them didn't realise it was Freddie Mercury. <laughs> he was such a character because, you know, it was his mission to get as much money for AIDS as possible. And he was the ice cream seller in the interval. Isn't that cool? People must have gone absolutely <laughs> nuts when they realised. Well, some must have, because yeah, you couldn't mistake him no. with his moustache. <laughs> they must have realised, and he must have stopped then, so otherwise there would have been a surge, you know. Yeah. But yeah. He, that's what he did, yeah. Good for him. It's brilliant. With all this going on, you've been one of the most sought-after session singers, and your voice has been on adverts, so you did a cover of Take My Breath Away. You were the model for Debenham singing Just In Love With You. You've also performed impersonations on Spitting Image, there was no typical day, but I know you were very busy. So what could a day in the life of Sonia Jones look like? Well, I loved it, and we all did. There was a pool of session singers. So I'd get maybe my first session at 10 o'clock. All, all these studios were in Soho at that time. Uh, say I'd do, like, Take My Breath Away. That was uh, for Peugeot. So that would take an hour, say an hour, to do that. Then we'd go to a place called The Ship, in Warder Street, and we'd meet, that would be like the office for all the session singers and producers. So if somebody needed somebody, they'd go, oh, Song, can you come across the road and do a session at 12 o'clock? And I'd go, yep, I'd be there. Then in the afternoon, somebody might say, can you come and do an album, some backing vocals for three hours? And can you, 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 and you come? Yep, great, the three of us will go. We were doing three or four sessions a day. I mean, we didn't stop. And then after that, we'd go to Tramp or somewhere and party because we were so buzzed you know on yeah. life on singing not drugs you know we wanted to go and relax so that was our life that was my life most of my life <laughs> oh, that's awesome you're more than capable of being a lead singer why did you decide against that and to opt to be a backing singer I thought I wanted to be a lead singer and I, like I said I had two or three record deals uh, big record deals but I didn't like performing live I loved it but I got so nervous I used to hate it and I thought, why am I putting myself through this? It was horrible. I really, really got so nervous. And it put me off. And I thought, back in the backing vocal, I can sing. And I haven't got all the pressure of being the lead vocal. So that really is. And was it a particular moment when you thought, right, that's it. I just don't want to get this nervous ever again. Or was it like a creeping realisation that this was just, life was too short to be this stressed? Yeah. It was a creeping realisation. I really enjoyed doing the backing vocals more. And I had a terrible problem with remembering lyrics. So if I forgot a <laughs> lyric, then I couldn't sing that song without worrying every night if you're on tour. So I never relaxed until I got that song over, singing the lead. And I thought, no way, I'm not doing this. I just wanted to give up because because of nerves. Yeah, You do crazy things. You forget lyrics, you know them off by heart. You can sing it in your hotel room and then you get on stage and you get a blank. And I used to think, oh, my God, I can't That's do so this. That's so frightening. Yeah, it's terrifying in front of an O2 audience, you know, thousands of people, the Albert Hall. Uh -uh. <laughs> Slightly different question. Of yes. all the amazing artists that you've worked with, who stands out? I must be honest. Nearly everybody, honestly, that I've worked with have been absolutely incredible. And the bigger the star the nicer they seem to be because they've got nothing to prove. But uh, one time I was doing a TV series in the BBC and Al Jarreau was a guest. And we again went for a curry in the break. And I've never met anybody with so much love pouring out of him, the smile, the, the whole aura all about him. And he, he, I just felt so happy to be in his company. Some people have that effect on you. Yeah. No, that's true. Gosh, that's very special. And then slightly different question. And you've answered it a little bit before. You said you had a crush on Shaking Stevens. But was there <laughs> we all did. anybody else that as you went along that you had a crush on? Well, before my teenage years, because I was in London in my teenage years, I had a huge crush on David Cassidy. I had his posters and I thought I was going to marry him. I really <laughs> believed I was. I really believed it. 
It was my first concert. I came to Wembley and I thought, I'm going to meet him. And everybody was fainting. It was one of those. Oh, very dangerous. <laughs> anyway, so when I was working on time and he replaced Cliff Richard, it was between him and John Travolta. Because John Travolta, after Saturday Night Fever and Grease, there was a bit of a lull before he did all the big films. So I remember going to meet David in the afternoon in the, and met him in the foyer of the Dominion. And were you were nervous about there, meeting him? Having I was had... so, I think, bloody hell, David <laughs> uh, But this guy came up to me and he was lovely and I felt nothing <laughs> at all. <laughs> and, he didn't, and he came round my house for dinner. We went out for meals with all the cast together and everything. And there was nothing, 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 nothing. No chemistry at all. He was lovely. They say you must never meet your idol. So I, I, I agree with that saying. <laughs> so Donny Osmond was my crush. Well, I've got a very, very funny story about Donny Osmond. I used to do with Sonny and Sue back in vocals from Brotherhood Man. We used to do all the live froms on TV shows every weekend. They used to have massive stars and we had back Joe Cocker, everybody you can think of. And Donny Osmond was one of the stars one weekend. So we went up to the little room on the Sunday morning to rehearse with Donny and it was a, a selection of his hits. And he went, and they called it puppy love. And I thought, oh, he can't sing. <laughs> and we all looked at each other and we were doing the BVs and he did it all perfect, a semitone under, all the way through, all the thing. And he burst out laughing. He'd been winding us up. He was oh. a wonderful singer, but it, it's so hard to do that. And I just thought, oh, you can't sing after all these <laughs> he got years. You. And it's probably a prank he plays on lots of people, you know. But he was great. Really gorgeous guy. So he was a good person for me good to have person. a crush on. Definitely, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Now, Sonia, you will have seen a lot of these artists have fallen off the rails. Elvis Presley, Amy Winehouse. And I guess it's that whole thing where they end up with an overload of hype, fame, adoration and pressure. And, and it just blows up. How do you manage to stay on the right side of the tracks and not blow up? What would your advice be to young people who get tempted and it all becomes too much? Well, it goes hand in hand because, well, say like Amy Winehouse, she became such a massive star as a young girl. And well, she didn't even drink or anything when she was signed to Ireland, when Darker signed her. But it's the pressure and the nerves, the nerves of a big part, because most of these superstars, they're very, very nervous. They all say they are because they've got... You know, you're a human being. You're not playing a keyboard. Your a voice can come out and it can come out out of tune or you can forget the words like I used to. And so it's a huge pressure. So she probably started with a couple of drinks to relax. Then the bigger they get, the more drugs are dangled. Oh, take this. It's like the stories of the Hollywood people like Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe. They have uppers to keep them awake, downers to make them sleep. And you become addicted to drugs and it just happens. Yeah. And have you witnessed a lot of that in your career? To be honest, not really. Because when I worked with The Who, Peter wasn't even drinking. Roger was totally straight. Um, John Entwistle, bless him, because he's passed now. He used to party every night. <laughs> well, I think we all know that. <laughs> I won't say any more about that. But Cliff, David Gilmore, to totally, totally straight, not drinking. To go on these long tours especially the singers, you have to be in great form. And if you dabble in that, you're not. You're not. You can't be. Your voice will go. Anyway, back to you. Yes. Um, not content with the fact that you've been doing all these other things, you then turn your hand to coaching. And I am lucky enough to be taught by you, mm -hmm. as are my daughters, and armed with your combination of techniques, exercises, positive reinforcement, you have managed to get the best out of all of us. And Quite frankly, if you can make me sing, you can make anyone Rubbish, sing. Rubbish, you're a wonderful singer. <laughs> so I did a little bit of a survey and I've got a couple of comments from your pupils. Oh, So Anna B said, Sonia is the most wonderful singing teacher. She is so encouraging, honest and passionate. I love having lessons with her and she has transformed my voice. Lara Blue said, Sonia is an incredible vocal coach. Not only has she helped me find my voice and increase my range, she gives me support, encouragement and confidence to perform and record. She does all this with love and is great fun to be around. 
Meanwhile, I also have um, a comment from Izzy Bazoo, which is, from the moment I met Sonia, she made me tea and we chatted. Next thing I know, we were doing breathing exercises on the trampoline and then to her wooden grand for scales and laos, which often sound and feel like a meditative ritual. By the end, I hold notes for longer than I anticipated and feel high from all the oxygen going around my body. We then laugh giddy and talk about funny things that happened in the week or dreams that we'd like to achieve. She has made me a more confident woman and I always leave feeling like I can do anything and do well. Her joy and passion for life and music is infectious. She makes you feel like you're most, the most important person in the room. She really listens and brings the best out of people. I'm so inspired by her and I'm in constant awe of her upbeat energy. And the last one is from Sodi. Oh, my and gorgeous And Sodi said, Sonia is the most loyal person I have ever met. I've known her since I was 10 years old. And in that time, she has been nothing but kind and has given me vocal knowledge that I will cherish forever. She is always there if you need a call. And I am so grateful to know her. I love her with all my heart. Oh, my God. I love her. You're making me cry. <laughs> you made no. me cry when I read it. Yes. So you've coached the likes of Rita Ora. Yep. Sodi, Izzy Bazoo, yep. Ward Thomas, Bombay Bicycle Club. Tell me about the satisfaction that you get from coaching. Oh, I love it because they say it's one to one for an hour. In that hour, boy, do we pack things in, you know, from breathing to just exercising. And it's not teaching any of these people to sing. It really is like you would if you were on a run for a marathon. These people are professional. So they're going on tour or in the studio. So they have to be at the top of their game because it's tough out there. So the coaching is to, to make sure their vocal cords, their diaphragm, the muscles they're breathing, everything is in tip-top shape. Then sometimes, you know, with Izzy, sometimes we'll go through some of her new songs before she records them to make sure she's got the right placements so she's got the best shapes in her mouth. You know, we do a lot of mirror work, so we get the best sounds before she goes in the studio. So it saves a lot of time and trauma for the artist in the studio because it can be very vulnerable. And if a producer behind a glass and you can see them all talking, it puts you off your performance. So when they go in and they can do it in two or three takes, it's great. <laughs> well, you're absolutely brilliant at it but in addition to your coaching you are the linchpin in the band the stacks um put yes by david fitzsimmons sam brown put me my gorgeous sam put me forward for that i wasn't sure if i wanted to be in a band because i was doing more session work and i went and saw stacks in the half moon and they blew me away i thought i love this band i really want to be on stage with them and we've worked with steve winwood Stax have guest vocalists, lead vocalists. So it was Steve Winwood, we've had Lulu, we've had Beverly Knight, we've had lovely Paul Carrick. Gosh, who else was there? There was Misha Paris. Misha Paris, yeah. Great Joss Misha. Stone. Joss Stone. Oh, she was lovely. Lovely Joss. And um, but you work out all the BV harmonies yes. and you train all the all the, the, B, the BVs, um, yeah, a lot more as well. You, your role keeps expanding. You're, you seem to be needed everywhere. And you now have a new project. You have set up your own company, Dragonfly Artists. Yep, it's brand new. Through lockdown, I was so bored. I thought I've got to do something. And I approached one of my favorite guitarists, Tony Remy. I called him up to see how he was. And he was in his garden, smoking a cigar with a glass of wine red wine, always red wine. And I said, Tony, how are you? And he said, man, he said, I've never worked. I've worked since I'm 16. I've never had a break like this. He said, I haven't picked a guitar up for months. And I said, well, that's got to stop. And then I put the phone down. I thought, what can I do? And I thought, my favorite singer who guests sometimes with Stax and written some of the new Stax album is Steve Overland that I met 30 years ago, that, that concert Tokyo in trip. that Tokyo trip. And I approached Steve and I said, Steve, I want to put you and Tony together. And Steve said, really? He said, I love Tony, but I said, no, I want you to write. So they came down here and they started writing in the garden. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what direction. And it was brilliant. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the best thing I've heard for. The two of them together just clicked. So and now we're nearly finished an album 
and I've decided I'm going to manage them and I want to take them all the way. <laughs> I've been lucky enough to hear some of the songs and they are incredible. So they need to go all the way. They, they will, they it. will, they will. <laughs> um, well, they will have you with you behind them. So you've had this extraordinary glittering career. There must have been some setbacks. How did you deal with them? Honestly, I've been so lucky. I haven't really had any setbacks. It's always been an adventure to me. Each job that came in was another challenge and another adventure. And everybody, because they're at the top of their profession, they were great. The only thing I did have was some of the girls, some of the session girls were very catty because they were so ambitious. I've always thought I'm quite a nice person. And they were a bit cruel. Jealousy, that's the only thing, but not from main artists or anything. It was from other singers. And that used to make me have a few sleepless nights, worrying what I'd done. But it was their problem. Well, no, absolutely, it is their problem. Their insecurity. But it's hard sometimes to not take that on and, and yes. make it your own. I'm the sort of person that worries and wants everybody to be happy. So that was about the only setback. Now, it's a very different world for aspiring artists today. What advice would you give to young people who are wanting to follow in your footsteps? Okay. Well, I don't think there's much of a job going as a session singer anymore because of record companies don't spend the money unless you're a big band like the Stones. But for new bands, they book people that can sing a bit and because it's an extra two or three people. And the commercials have changed because... They use library music of people that have already covered. So they, instead of getting somebody to do Take My Breath Away, like me, cover it and do a sound alike, they'd use the originals because that means the publishers are making money. So that all that job's gone. But for aspiring, like your daughters, it's hard work and they've got to give it 100% because unless you do, like Sodi and Joy, all, they breathe, Joy Crooks, they've signed with Sony both of them signed with Sony, different labels in Sony, and all they do is work, 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 write, 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 work, and it's hard. That's the only so way. That, and you've got to be really good as well. You've got to be really talented as well. Okay, no, well, that's good advice. I recently heard you sing Perfect Day at a friend's wedding, and it was a knockout. What would be your perfect day? My perfect day, I would start for breakfast in the sun with my daughter, because when she lived in London, she used to ring and go, Mum, should we go out for breakfast? It's her favourite meal of the day. And so we'd, we'd go and have breakfast and a catch-up together. It was so cool uh, because I wouldn't see her the rest of the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd probably do a lesson or something with somebody I really loved. So that always uplifts me. And then go for a nice walk in the afternoon, but always a gig in the night. That would be definitely because that gives you all the adrenaline. That would be my perfect day. Sonia, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It has been just wonderful. And I can't believe that I've known you for this length of time and I didn't know half of those stories. So I'm clearly have not been asking you enough over the years, but it has been absolutely joyous to hear your stories and will be a huge inspiration to younger aspiring artists to hear them as well. So thank you so much for your time. Katie, I enjoyed it. And thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you for listening to Katie Brewer at Bandwidth Conversations. If you would like to know more about us, please email katie at bandwidthconversations.com. We hope to see you again soon. Mm-hmm.